Am I interested? Yep. Oh, okay then. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Alicia Carriquiri from uh, talking to you from uh, CSAFE in Ames, Iowa. Uh, today, before we get started with today's webinar, let me make one announcement. Uh, remind everybody that we have an open tenure track faculty position in statistics associated to uh, CSAFE at Iowa State. So please, uh, if you have excellent students, remember to send them our way. Uh, we're looking to hire uh, somebody this year. Uh, done with the propaganda, let me go back to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is uh, on DNA mixture interpretation. Uh, we are lucky to have uh, our colleagues John Butler and Harry Iyer from NIST, uh, who will be doing the presentation. Let me introduce you to them, although they really need no introduction. Uh, John Butler is a NIST Fellow and Special Assistant to the Director of Forensic Science uh, Programs at NIST. Uh, he received a PhD in chemistry uh, in, uh, from the University of Virginia in 1995 and has entirely too many awards for me to uh, list. He is, of course, um, the perhaps the most important contributor to um, research in uh, forensic DNA uh, analysis uh, and has written just about every book uh, in every canonical book uh, on the on DNA type, forensic DNA typing. Uh, Harry Iyer uh, is uh, a mathematical statistician also at NIST. He uh, received his first PhD in mathematics, I believe in 1974 from University of Notre Dame, and his second PhD, like one wasn't enough, in statistics from Colorado State University in 1990. And we are very, very lucky, forensic scientists are very lucky that he decided to work in forensic statistics. He's currently um, interested in fiducial inference, his, uh, his long-term love, uh, but also in um, likelihood ratios for uh, pattern uh, comparison. So without further ado, I'm going to let them take it away. Uh, let me remind you that there's going to be an opportunity for questions afterwards. Uh, one other comment, this is our last webinar for the year. We're taking a break in December. So happy holidays to everybody if we don't get to see you before January. All right, now what? John, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Okay. Anybody see that okay? Yep. It's going up? Okay. Good. All right, excellent. Well, thank you to Alicia and the CSAFE who have invited us to speak. Uh, we're going to cover some uh, things that we've learned and just some thoughts on a few things from the uh, Scientific Foundation Review we're currently working on in terms of DNA mixture interpretation. Yeah. Just point out that the views that we're, that Hari and I will present are ours and not those of the official positions of NIST. And if we talk about any commercial products, we're not endorsing them, we're just identifying what they are. So NIST has uh, kind of four primary areas that it's focusing on right now in terms of forensic science activities, conducting research, partnering with the community, uh, primarily right now through OSAC, and then we have efforts to convene various meetings that have been held over the years. And then most recently to start exploring scientific foundations. So DNA mixture interpretation that we'll be discussing today is our first foundation review. And we've also started one on bite mark analysis and uh, recently one on firearms uh, examination. So in terms of these scientific foundation reviews, the seeds for this activity were planted with two National Commission on Forensic Science documents that were entitled, uh, related to technical merit evaluations for, for us, forensic science methods and practices. And congressional funding is now coming to NIST to work on these uh, that used to go to the commission. So the purpose of, of a foundation review is what was identified in the National Commission on Forensic Science Technical Merit Evaluation of Use document, which stated that there should be some independent uh, group looking at uh, facilitating gathering of scientific research, knowledge and expertise over time, and creating a service resource for forensic science 
technology uh, research and user communities, and then the development of a trusted and impartial process of evaluating technical merit of forensic practices, and then sharing that with uh, stakeholders in the community so that people would know what's good science and, and what still needs to be worked on. So we, about a year ago, we published an uh, initial draft of what our plan was, and this outlines kind of the history of where we've come from in terms of the introduction of these ideas, where the National Academy of Sciences, the Subcommittee on Forensic Science, PCAS, and the AAAS studies and other activities that have gone on. And we had a public comment period for about two months, and we received 13 responses, and those will be addressed when we finalize this document. Um, we haven't done that yet because we're waiting to kind of finalize a few things with our foundation reviews, but there's nothing really too significant in terms of changing what is currently there in terms of our plan for the foundation reviews. So why, why DNA mixtures? Uh, one of the uh, primary reasons is because this is some, a challenge that labs are facing. This is from a Los Angeles Times article um, about six weeks ago that, this, that uh, points out, this is on rapid DNA, but it pointed out that there's no question that, that single source DNA works well, uh, the, but the challenge comes with mixtures, and this quote is from Vince Figarelli from Arizona. Mixture interpretation is the, the most difficult thing that crime laboratory analysts have to do by far. And so, I mean, he's talking in the context of rapid DNA, but we believe it's something that's challenging that labs are facing. What makes uh, DNA mixture interpretation challenging? Uh, there's nine primary reasons we've kind of um, identified and distilled down from our efforts in thinking about this. Um, number one, you have artifacts that are produced in the process, stutter products that are produced in the process of generating a DNA profile. You have to figure out which, what, uh, which ones are real versus true alleles from a, from a possible another contributor. It's challenging to determine the number of uh, potential contributors that exist in a complex mixture. You're also dealing with uh, many scenarios that you're trying, sometimes trying to present that data and trying to make that understandable. Uh, that's something beyond just what's done in the lab, but it's how do you communicate those results to someone else. We have to place some kind of, the challenge is often placing limits on the degree of complexity that, that a lab will examine, and sometimes even the lowest amount of DNA they may consider amplifying and interpreting, and that varies by laboratory, and that makes uh, this challenging as well to see what labs would actually send through their process of interpretation. There's also uh, many new probabilistic genotyping systems that have become available, and so uh, how do, you, do we have sufficient training in the community for that? And that's something we've considered as we've been looking at this. Understanding the, the possibilities of DNA transfer and the potential impact they could have on a case. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about this topic and the, the relevance issue that can relate there. What types of uh, validation experiments should be done to cover the range of samples that may be seen in casework? Um, how you convey to report users the meaning of those results? Uh, often when you have a lower, a very low LR, a likelihood ratio value, what does that actually mean in terms of conveying that? And then finally, uh, the challenge of obtaining consistent results across analysts and laboratories. So back in April, as part of this effort uh, that we've been working on for the last almost two years now, is we came up with a DNA mixture explainer that kind of explains why mixtures are challenging. And you can, we have the link here, you just, you just do a search for DNA mixtures, it's one of the top hits you'll get on Google from there. And it uses illustrations like the illustration on the lower uh, right-hand corner of John Q's suspect as from vegetable soup and then trying to figure out uh, how well you can tell that relative to other um, spoonfuls you may pull up of, of similar um, individuals based on the alleles that are present versus the genotypes that are actually from the individuals that contribute to that sample. So there's uncertainties that exist in all of this, and so we've, we've tried to spell those out in, in this DNA explainer. So I commend that to you as something to go and look to uh, further. So there's been a lot of change in the last few years for DNA mixture interpretation. There's been dramatic growth in the use of probabilistic genotyping software, or PGS, as sometimes we'll refer to in this presentation. There's more than 50 labs that are now using StarMix, Trulio, Lab Retriever, um, Forensic Statistical Tool, or FST, has been used by New York City for a number of years as well. And there's many new publications that have come out on the theory and the data behind probabilistic genotyping models. And there's uh, one of the, the things that's happened the last couple of years with the growth in the National DNA Database is there's a widespread adoption of new megaplex kits. And that also, people are switching to new instruments. That means there's lots of new validation studies that have been done. And also in the last 
um, three years from a recent uh, review I did, I found that there was 30, there's been 34 new guidelines or standards that have been published related to DNA. And uh, I just illustrate two here from SWIGDAM and from the FBI quality assurance standards that are changing. But that means there's lots of new information for laboratories to kind of try to absorb and, and learn from. So when we look at DNA mixtures, there's several aspects that are important to consider. And what we, this is what we call factor space in terms of the areas that need to be covered and considered. You have the total amount of DNA that's being looked at. This might be one nanogram or 100 picograms, depending on how much is available in the sample. You have to consider as well the lowest amount of DNA that might be present in a minor contributor. How much has that been tested for in, in, uh, in terms of with validation experiments? You have the contributor component ratios. If it's a two-person mixture, it might be 10 to 1 or 1 to 1 or so on. If it's a three-person mixture, it may be 1 to 1 to 1 or 1 to 1 to 5 or some other um, relative ratio of the contributors that are present. One of the things that we found is quite important is the degree of allele overlap across the mixture components. And this is something that uh, is almost never discussed in publications, but you have the fact that you have minor contributor alleles that can be in the stutter position of major contributors. And so you have to sort that out. And of course, there's the models that are in the probabilistic genotyping programs can account for that, but that's something that's often challenging as people are, are trying to figure out how well they can do low level um, samples where there may be dropout and so on. And finally, the number of contributors, you may have a two person sexual assault sample that's lots of DNA, or you may have a touch evidence sample that has four or more people and trying to figure out uh, how, how many contributors there are is often challenging because of the issue of degree degree of allele overlap and the amount of DNA and the contributor component ratios that are identified there. So different laboratories will have different types of mixtures that come into their, their labs depending on the type of evidence that they're running. And so they will have to have spent time thinking about this factor space in their validation studies. So there's many different approaches that have been taken for mixture interpretation over the years. We have uh, binary methods have been used mostly for two-person mixtures, but likelihood ratios have been, since 1991, have been um, stressed and used effectively, uh, even in the, the National Research Council 1996 study talks about that. The use of a combined probability of inclusion, where you can see all the alleles that would be present, uh, is emphasized in the, the, again, the National Research Council 1992 report. Um, Bruce Fidoli and colleagues at the FBI have a nice paper from, nine, from 2009, and Fred Bieber and colleagues uh, published an article in 2016 about some of the ways, the limits of what you can do with CPI. Of course, there's deconvolution, and you may be able to pull out a major contributor and then do a random mass probability on that. And then uh, over the last few years, we've had the growth of probabilistic genotyping software. The theory was introduced about 20 years ago, and early implementations happened uh, in at the Forensic Science Service, um, and also uh, Robert Cowell uh, produced the gamma model that he described in 2007. And then there's been a number of discrete and continuous models that have been published over the years and described in the literature. So in terms of what, the, what these mean, a binary is when you're just looking at all the pe peaks that are there, or you either, they're either there or they're not there. There's no allowance for a, for a little dropout. This is just a summary from Euro, Eurofins on this. We have discrete or sometimes called semi-continuous where you have the presence or absence of peaks are considered, but you're not considering the peak heights. And finally, you have continuous systems that are uh, that exist that you're also considering peak height as well as probability of drop-in and drop-out. So the binary is either it's there, the probability of one, or it's not, a probability of zero. And then the, the peak probability can be greater than zero or less than one with a probabilistic system. And so probabilistic genotyping software can either be discrete or continuous. And uh, just this quote uh, that I like from uh, Howard Skipper, the model is a lie that allows you to see the truth. And so that's what models do is they provide the opportunity to see further, but it's only as good as the, the data that's used to train it and the, the theory behind the model. So we have to make sure that we're exploring that model properly in terms of testing things. So there's, as, as of the last count that I've done, there's uh, 15 different probabilistic genotyping systems that are available. And in terms of the, in the United States, uh, the FST from New York City and Lab Retriever are two that are uh, discrete systems. And then we have continuous systems being StarMix and TrueAllele are the most commonly used there. 
<clears throat> the uh, pro the Government Accountability Office uh, just has started uh, publishing on science and technology spotlights, and they published on a two-page summary of what probabilistic genotyping software is and how it's being used um, briefly. And this is their um, why this matters. Uh, this just came out two months ago. They point out the validity of the analyses remain unsettled, at least from the perspective of the authors of the GAO publication. <clears throat> so. NIST has been involved in doing a study uh, for about the last two years now, and we have a team of six that meet mostly weekly uh, that are looking at the literature and, and the, all the various issues. I mean, but there's five from NIST, and then we had uh, Sheila Willis, the guest researcher here from Ireland, to help us with some of the project. And then we've had a resource group, uh, the 13 practitioners, academics, and consultants that have uh, provided input across 12 different meetings that we've held here at NIST. And they provided wonderful input. And we had initial draft that we provided to them in June. And they're not, they're not being asked to endorse the report conclusions or the key takeaways, but we've used their feedback to kind of um, go and work on this further. So the primary goals of what we're doing with this study and this review is to, to generate a bibliography of relevant literature, try to understand what are the principles characterizing the capabilities and limitations, looking for the knowledge gaps, and then to, to inform the community and use this also as a framework to look for future studies that we'll be doing in this area. So we did a workshop back in February at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and we plan to re re release a report soon. So this is the, uh, there's about 400 slides that are available on the NIST website, on the Starbase website, that has information from kind of where we were at that point. And you can see the, the uh, resource group members and all, all but two participated in this particular a workshop that we did. So the, the resources that we've been looking at in our review are looking at the scientific literature, looking at proficiency tests, internal validations that are that are publicly available, and then interlaboratory data, and trying to see, uh, and for the various reasons here, interlaboratory data provides kind of the biggest uh, view of seeing the degree of variability or reproducibility across laboratories. The PT and internal validation demonstrate the ability within a laboratory, and then the scientific literature kind of gives you a broad base of what's been studied. So our initial draft report that we made is we found was too long. That's one of the feedbacks we got from our resource group, and we're in the process of revising it. So we'll have an executive summary, um, acknowledgments and disclaimers, an introduction. We'll go through the principles and practice, the data sources we used, and then the core of the the meat of the report really is around reliability and relevance, and it'll be an aspect on new technologies and it'll literature listing and so on. We're, we've, we had other doc, parts of the document that uh, we're probably going to pull out and put into uh, appendices uh, on like the history or on or ancillary documents that may be available on the website uh, that, that will go with this report. Now, what we're going to focus on today really is reliability aspect, and so Hari is going to get into what we've been thinking about in terms of the likelihood ratio, discrimination capacity, and the calibration issues that relate to validation. So we'll turn it over to Hari. Good morning, everyone. So picking up uh, where John left off, uh, disclaimer again, so I'll go over that quickly. The discussion is based on what makes sense to us. No claims made these are new and then the standard NIST disclaimer. I want to acknowledge uh, Steve Lund, who actually contributed tremendously to create this slide deck, and also my teammates uh, in the Scientific Foundation uh, Review, and the members of the uh, resource group. So DNA measurement and interpretation is a complex process consisting of many steps the first part involves gathering data, uh, extraction, quantitation, et cetera. I would call that the measurement step, which results in an electrophorogram or EPG. Uh, and that uh, information from EPGs uh, used to uh, invoke uh, probabilistic models, and you come up with an interpretation or a, some measure of the probative value of the evidence. Uh, so you have a, a crime scene uh, uh, EPG and a person of interest profile, and the question is uh, how much, uh, what is the weight of evidence uh, 
uh, provided uh, here uh, in favor of a proposition, say prosecution proposition, that the DNA from the person of interest is in the sample versus the alternate proposition, which is that it's not in the sample. So all you need is uh, one proposition, which is the prosecution proposition, then the defense proposition is automatically the negation of HP. Uh, it is uh, nowadays very common to express this probative value in terms of a likelihood ratio, which is defined here as the probability of uh, evidence or expert findings given HP divided by the probability of expert findings given HD. And there is also this I that you see, which uh, refers to background information that one has prior to examining the evidence. If you ask someone what's the meaning of the likelihood ratio, say if the likelihood ratio is a thousand, uh, then they would explain that the findings are thousand times more likely to occur under HP than under HD. Uh, but most of us are aware that there is a, a strong possibility of misunderstanding this or misinterpreting this. And often people turn this into a, uh, an interpretation where they think it is the findings. Based on the findings, HP is 1,000 times or a million times more likely to be true than HD is. This everyone knows is called transposing the conditional or the prosecu prosecutor's fallacy. This is uh, of relevance uh, when you go into federal rules of evidence. So uh, we use the term LR system to refer to the entire pipeline starting from sample acquisition to producing a, a value of evidence uh, statistics such as LR. And the question is, uh, is this a reliable system? Now, why, do we, uh, why are we interested in this? Well, obvious reasons, uh, anything that is regarded as scientific, must have some level of reliability associated with it. Also, uh, from a legal perspective, uh, the, the courts do care that uh, information given to the court is reliable. So a quick look at the Federal Rules of Evidence 702 that pertains to expert testimony. Um, I would just... Um, bring your attention to part C and D, where they talk about the testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. And I would say that refers to the system reliability or process reliability. And they also say that uh, the expert reliably has reliably applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. So here the concern is the particular case, and I would refer to that as case-specific reliability. Now, uh, for those interested, you can go to this uh, website, the www.law.cornell, to get more details. Now, in 1993, uh, some amendments were made after a Daubert versus Merrill Dow case, where the trial judges were given the responsibility to act as gatekeepers to exclude unreliable expert testimony. So again, uh, they use the words reliable and unreliable, and that's the reason that uh, uh, we want to look at the meaning of the term reliability in some detail. The uh, Daubert uh, uh, amendments also provided a checklist uh, to help uh, trial courts to assess reliability of scientific expert testimony. And the checklist talks about known or potential rate of error, which is related to reliability. And they also talk about existence of standards and controls. Now, there is a, uh, a sister rule, Federal Rules of Evidence 403, which allows the court to exclude relevant evidence, even if the 
if the probative value of the evidence is substantially outweighed by danger of confusion or jury being misled. So some people, some defense attorneys have argued that the transposing the conditional problem uh, could be a challenged, uh, could be a reason to challenge uh, evidence introduction under 403. So what is uh, reliability? We have used the word reliability all along. The federal rules talk about reliability, but it's not very easy to give a precise definition. The one that seems to uh, make sense is to be able to produce good results time after time. So a system is reliable if it rarely makes mistakes. So that's an easy way to think about it. You can also look at the dictionary meaning. So here I pulled out from the Cambridge Dictionary, talks about reliability as how accurate or able to be trusted someone or something is considered to be. So trust is uh, another aspect of reliability. So plain English meaning of the word reliability is trustworthiness. There's some confusion because in psychology and related fields, they use the term reliability to mean consistency. But what is required here, uh, we, don't, we don't think reliability means consistency. It's, a, it's just a part of reliability, but trustworthiness or very rarely making errors or never making errors is what uh, gives reliability. So it, a method is reliable if it produces good results time after time. So what's meant by good? Now this is not uh, something you can give a binary answer to. You don't talk about something as reliable or unreliable, um, but you talk about degrees of reliability. So you don't say method has a high degree of reliability. What you need is facts and data. To illustrate this, so consider a statement like this in, a, in the medical context. This surgical procedure has an excellent track record of being successful. Well, that excellent is somebody's judgment. Facts, 90 out of 100 patients who underwent this surgery survived and lived for at least five more years. The other 10 died on the operating table. Now that is the data, and this is a subjective judgment. So judgments of reliable, unreliable, or personal, but facts and data are not. So uh, in science, reliability is often based on empirical demonstrations. Now theories and mathematics help come up with uh, potential explanations for natural phenomena but until they are empirically verified or demonstrated, they are just theory. So here is a simple example. Say, let's say that uh, you take a, a US quarter from your purse or pocket and you toss it twice. And I ask you, what is the probability that both tosses will give heads? And most people, based on their training, uh, would say, probability is one-fourth because they use this model which seems reasonable to them that you know it's a probability of heads in a single toss of a coin is a half and there's no reason to doubt that it's not and they think uh, that the result of one toss doesn't affect the result of any other toss so independence then mathematics under this model will give them uh, the answer one quarter Okay, so but you can check this experimentally. So you take a coin, toss it twice, and record the number of heads, zero, one, or two. You do this thousand times, and you get the following data. Well, first I'm only showing what you would expect under the theoretical model. You would expect 250 out of 1,000 times to get both heads. But suppose that your experiment produced observations that look like this. You only got 100 
out of the thousand times, both heads. Then you would question the, the model and you may have to make some adjustments. So uh, in this connection, uh, my favorite quote comes from Richard Feynman, Nobel Laureate, 1965, who says, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it is wrong. So now let's go to reliability considerations in the context of mixture interpretation. We talked about the LR system before. That's the entire pipeline going from sample acquisitions to a weight of evidence number. It has many steps. There are components. One can study the reliability of each component, uh, and that gives us some information of what we can expect for system reliability. But uh, the only way that you're going to check system reliability is to test the system. Now, reliability is related to probability of failure, probability of error. So high reliability means system rarely makes mistakes. Uh, and high reliability in a particular case is that we, we assess the probability of failure to be very low in this case. Likewise, re low reliability means high probability of failure. Going back to the... Uh, formula uh, or definition for likelihood ratio, we saw this background information I. So what is I? So any information that is taken to be true while assessing the probability of interest, which is uh, some of them are like background crime-related information before examining the crime sample, statistical models used, number of contributors assumed or known, et cetera. So this is the likelihood ratio that expert is trying to assess. However, to assist in making this assessment, uh, the I consists of, we can break this I into two parts, where IA consists of assumptions made by the expert or the LR system, and IU consists of background, ideally uncontestable information. All parties agree to that information. But different LR systems will have different I sub A and therefore end up producing different LR values. The question is, how close is the provided LR to what we actually sought to get? Now, uh, it's useful to also look at uh, how reliability is related to complexity of the sample. You can uh, imagine uh, the horizontal axis here showing increasing levels of complexity, and the vertical axis showing increasing levels of reliability and the green dash line as uh, perfect reliability or 100% correct every time. And a particular LR system may have very high degree of reliability for low complexity and then the reliability falls off. A not so good LR system might have a reliability complexity curve that looks like this and even less desirable system might look like this. So uh, what should uh, labs do? Uh, how do you decide where to set limits of complexity beyond which you will not analyze samples? So here is a way to think about it. If you know the degree of reliability that's acceptable, as shown by the red dashed line, then you can use the reliability complexity curve to figure out what the limit is for that particular system in terms of complexity. For the medium method, you will have a limit that's lower, and for the bad or not so good method, the limit would be even lower. So even a less reliable system 
may be adequate for uh, mixtures that are not very complex. Alternatively, uh, you may reduce your, lower your standard, and then you would be able to analyze more complex samples. How do you judge the reliability of an LR system? This can be empirically judged based on a collection of tests using casework like ground truth known samples designed to assess two things. First, ability of the system to use all the available information efficiently so you discriminate between HP and HD as best as possible. So this is discrimination, high discrimination power, and the extent to which the results can be demonstrated to not systematically overstate or understate the value of evidence. We'll get back to this later. This would be addressed under the title of calibration. Now, it's important to note that empirical demonstrations of agreement among different labs, uh, though desirable, by itself doesn't demonstrate degree of system reliability. There is also case-specific reliability or reliability as applied, uh, which was one of the components of FRE 702. So this formula we saw before, different LR systems give different results because they differ with respect to this models or assumptions they use in helping calculate this LR. Systems with comparable reliability for cases like the one in hand will still give different results for the case. In some cases, the differences may not be impactful, but in other cases, they may be. If two different comparably reliable methods give different LR values, but the use of one value could lead to a very different decision or conclusion than the other, then one could not claim reliability of either one of them for this case. So ideally, what we would like to know in this situation is the range of LRs produced by the top performing LR systems for each case to be able to judge whether their decision is being unduly influenced by a particular choice of this IA. We have also heard it mentioned often that there is no true LR. That raises the question, well, then is any value acceptable value for LR? Obviously, the answer is no. Some LR systems may be considered sufficiently reliable for use in casework and others not. We have also heard of the term validation and of statements that a model or a process has been validated, which often is uh, interpreted as reliable. Validation is not binary concept, nor is it universal. This is what my friend uh, Steve Lund keeps mentioning to me all the time. So what is the, but you do conduct validation studies. Conducting a validation study is not validating the system. The purpose of uh, validation study is to gather enough information so you can make reliability assessments based on available empirical data uh, for system reliability as well as case-specific reliability. So for any given casework application, an LR system may be very reliable, somewhat reliable, or unreliable. A good validation study would collect data that can inform the trier of fact or decision makers regarding reliability pertaining to that case. So bottom line is a validation study cannot give a pass-fail verdict for system reliability unless the limits of applicability and the error rate thresholds or reliability threshold is explicitly stated. So what do we do for empirical assessment of LR systems in practice? As we mentioned, there are two aspects. One is the power to discriminate 
and the other is uh, calibration. Discrimination power uh, depends on how much of the information in the samples measured or extracted. For instance, uh, most of us know that models that make use of peak height, like continuous models, are more discriminating than other models. And, but it's also important that the information is used effectively. So the model itself has to take that information and uh, apply it correctly. Now we can uh, go through a thought experiment for what might be involved in making a comprehensive assessment of discrimination and calibration. So suppose we have a large collection of ground truth known DNA samples representing different casework scenarios. And for each sample, you uh, take either a known contributor profile or a known non-contributor profile, send this through a LR pipeline from analysis to interpretation, preferably in a blinded manner, and record the LR value obtained in each case, along with whether it was for a HP true situation or HD true situation. At the end of this exercise, you will have a collection of LR values that could be organized like this. These are two columns in an Excel spreadsheet. So one column is a collection of all the non-contributor LR. The other column is all the contributor LR. And you can visualize these using histograms or if you choose prob probability density functions. So here is the histogram for non-contributor LR and for contributor LR. I, I want to remind you that this is only a thought experiment. So uh, a, a LR system one, suppose it produces the non-contributor and contributor distributions that look like this. They are well separated and uh, so they seem to, this particular system seem to be able to discriminate uh, HP and HD very well. Here is an example of another system where the HP and HD distributions overlap, and so uh, it is not discriminating between HP and HD as well. Okay. Now you can see publications in the literature. So this one is Blake et al. in FSIG, where they use uh, receiver operating characteristic plots or ROC plots to compare the discrimination uh, ability of different LR systems. For accuracy or calibration, uh, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, a true likelihood ratio, that's a, uh, that's a theoretically correct likelihood ratio, has a, a built-in uh, promise. For instance, LR value of one occurs as often under HP as it does under HD. LR value of 10 must occur 10 times more often under HP than it does under HD, and so on. Okay. So in general, LR value X is X times more likely to occur under HP than under HD. So this is the promise that's built in to an LR uh, statement. Okay. This is sometimes uh, stated uh, with the phrase that LR of LR is LR. This property of likelihood ratios uh, was known for a long time. Uh, Green and Sweats 1966 is the earliest reference that I have, but I'm sure there are even earlier references one could find. So in principle, this LR of LR is LR property can be empirically tested. So going back to the thought experiment data, suppose I overlay, let me skip this, the non-contributor uh, histogram and the contributor histogram on top of each other, and I look at the LR value on the x-axis, LR of one, then you find that the height under the blue histogram, height under the red histogram are the same. So LR of one occurs 
equally often in the two cases. You look at LR of 10, the red shows how often it occurs under HP, the blue is how often under HD, and the red is about 10 times as tall as the blue. If you go to one tenth, the same thing happens, but in the reverse direction. So this is the sort of thing that you would expect uh, if a LR system is if an LR system is really producing LRs. Here is an example of a reasonably well discriminating system, but fails calibration check. You see, if you look at LR of 10, the non-contributor histogram, the contributor histogram seem to have about the same height. So in this case, LR of 10 would be an overstatement of evidence. So some takeaways. Uh, we want to focus on LR system reliability. And to improve system reliability, we often study component reliability. Even if component reliabilities are deemed satisfactory, uh, that doesn't mean that system reliability is automatically satisfactory. It needs to be checked. And when you examine published results from reliability studies, you need to focus on what parts of the system have been checked so that you don't confuse between component reliability with overall system reliability. We know there is no single correct LR. Does that mean we are justified in reporting any value? No. Some LR systems are less reliable than others. So what we need are LR systems that are well calibrated and have high discriminating power. That's what is our goal. A Couple of more takeaways. One LR system may appear to be as reliable as another based on aggregate measures. But in subpopulations or subsets and or selected scenarios, their performance can be different. And more importantly, different LR systems, even those regarded as equally reliable, will disagree in a given casework situation. The magnitude of this disagreement is crucial information for triers of fact. The disagreement in a given case needs to be studied and reported. So this is the point that uh, Steve and I tried to make in the paper or made in the paper likelihood ratio as weight of forensic evidence, a closer look. Uh, there were at least three rebuttal papers or letters to the editor uh, in response to our paper. And we believe that these rebuttals did not address any of our main concerns. And this slide gives you, uh, this is our paper and here are three rebuttals for those of you who want to go look into these in more detail, uh, this is, useful information. So I'm just going to have a few uh, summary summary thoughts and then we'll take time for, for questions here. So uh, one of the, the challenges that, that exists with the, the growth of DNA is the ability to become more sensitive. And so in the last decade, we've had sensitivity improvements. And this is one of the things I wrote in my last book on interpretation. As sensitivity of DNA typing improves, laboratory's ability to examine smaller samples increases. And this increased sensitivity is a two-edged sword. With greater capabilities come greater responsibilities to report meaningful results. And given the possibility of DNA contamination in secondary or even tertiary transfer in some instances, does the presence of a single cell or even a few cells in an evidentiary sample truly have meaning? Um, so in this foundation review, another aspect of what we're exploring is the relevance issue that relates to DNA transfer. And so this is a slide that Sheila Willis presented when we did this workshop at the International Symposium for Human Identification uh, back at the end of September. And the, at, there at the bottom of the slide, you have the link to it uh, on Starbase, uh, all the slides. So she gave all, about a 45 minute uh, presentation on this issue. So you can go and see all of her slides. I just put, put in a couple two of her slides in here just to illustrate some of the points. But that we, we focus on the need to, uh, there's more mixtures when you have a higher sensitivity, which is why people are then pushing to, to use probabilistic genotyping and stuff. And this, we can do better deconvolution with probabilistic genotyping, um, but you're also having to deal with the aspect of the, se the second part that she illustrates here, is the information needed on transfer to help assess the relevance of the recovered DNA. 
most of the literature that's been published to date has focused on the first part. How do we get results from these highly sensitive uh, DNA systems and, and dealing with mixtures? But the second point becomes really important when you consider that some of these, the lower level of the minor contributors and the trace contributors, that, are they even relevant in some cases? And so that becomes the challenge of, of how we look at that. So we're, we've explored these aspects in this. And as part of this foundation study, uh, team member of Sheila Willis has been looking at the literature on transfer and persistence. So we have a whole chapter that will examine issues surrounding uh, relevance. And we recognize that this is a challenging aspect and something new. There's been a lot of new literature in this in the last couple of years. And that's part of the things we're pulling out as part of this, uh, this study. So when, this is, when the report comes out, you'll see a lot more details in the analysis of this. In the meantime, I encourage you to go look at Sheila's slides that were part of the workshop that was done at ISHI. So a few uh, kind of final thoughts before we open up to questions. Uh, just kind of personal reflections that I've had as I've been working on this study. We've had a lot of very valuable input from our resource group. Getting their feedback on a regular basis, we met with them about every six to eight weeks, getting their input either through phone conferences or through in-person meetings. And these discussions have illustrated that these, these challenges are common across laboratories. We've also realized that there's not a common uniform language and terminology uh, that's in use. And we have another uh, pro project that's just beginning as well on a process map that's being developed by uh, Melissa Taylor is developing a process map. Currently, it's about 40 pages long of the full process for DNA testing. And this will feed into a human factors group that's going to be starting next, uh, early next year on DNA mixture interpretation and DNA interpretation in general. And there'll be a, this will go on for another couple of years. So the, the foundation review that work that we're working on will feed into that human factors work along with the process map that Melissa has been working on. But one of the big realizations we've had as we've been exploring these topics is we don't have common terminology for what is, you know, even what is a trace or trace DNA or touch DNA or terminologies and how people approach uh, setting thresholds and things like that for analytical thresholds and so on. Uh, in many cases, we have to consider what questions we're really addressing. And just getting a result and a likelihood ratio of numbers that come out, what does that really mean? And so that we have a lot of thought we put into the issue of relevance and, again, get going around the aspects of small amounts of material possibly being transferred. We've been thinking a lot about the fact that we need to have more performance-based testing. So that's what Hari's been going through here, is just going through what types of things need to be done to see that an LR system is working uh, fully and what can your data actually demonstrate there and get away from more task-driven efforts where did I meet a set of required studies, which is what uh, often is done right now in the field where people say, oh, I did a mixture study, I did a sensitivity study, I did a precision study, check, 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 I'm okay. And instead, how did it actually perform in this type of situation? That's what we think is really important, getting to, to that aspect. We feel like the community is going to benefit from having a comprehensive, as close as we can, a curated reference list. We recognize, and this is pointed out by some of the people that presented input to us on the foundation review framework, is that this will become dated. A reference list that we produce will become dated, and so we're trying to think of ways to have an ongoing way to update that. Uh, make that available on, on our website or other things like that. But this is a challenge of, as the literature continues to grow, how do we make sure that we have all the right uh, papers identified? But we, we hope that by having a good gathering of now more than 600 references that we've concluded and put into this report, that that'll be a valuable resource. And finally, I think spelling out the actual key principles behind what determines reliability, what determines relevance in these aspects with DNA interpretation, we feel would be very important going forward with training and helping with continued education across laboratories. And hopefully that will lead to more consistent results across laboratories as future inter-laboratory studies are performed and so on. So we'll take uh, some time for, for questions now, I guess. And we also have at the end here, we have our phone numbers and email addresses that you're welcome to contact us if you have uh, questions you want to dis discuss later. But thank you very much for your attention. And we'll be happy to, to take your questions at this time. Uh, thank you, everybody. There's a couple of, uh, there's a, a question from Peter Green. Hi, Peter. Can you
John, shall I read a question for you? Um, fine. We can't see anything if you're trying to show anything here. Oh, you can't? Um, How do you do go, that? Go to the chat. Go to the chat. Can you see it? Okay, chat. Okay. Yes. We um so we There's two comments, one from uh David Kay, I believe, and another one from Peter Green and from Jeff Salyards. Okay, so Peter Green says I wonder if reliability or, or complexity graphs miss something important. There's bias from underfitting, so reliability may suffer if complexity is too low. Comment on that, Harik? If there's bias from underfitting, so oh, so so I guess that uh, the the graph uh, I put up for illustrating assumed that reliability decreases as complexity increases. Uh, that's not necessarily always true. So you need to look at what that graph looks like for each system uh, by testing it. Yes. And then Peter Green also asked, how do you th think about uncertainty in allele frequencies or using different uh, wrong database in terms of influence on reliability? So yes, there's, we had a slide that we, we pulled out, but actually uh, there's lots of inputs that go into that likelihood ratio. And one of those is allele frequencies. And so that will have an impact on the, the number that comes out the back end. So yes, that is one of the aspects of, of uh, the, the variability that can exist here. Okay, there's another one. Is this, I guess this is from David Kay. I'll, throughout the social uh, science and much of statistics, not just, much, um, not just psychology, reliability has a well-defined meaning. So does validity. It is unfortunate, just in my opinion, for scientific reports to use reliability to mean valid. The Supreme Court acknowledges in Daubert that it is not using reliable, reliable in scientific sense. Okay, so I don't know if there's a question there or just a comment. So. Well, um, personally, like I like I stated in one of the early slides, these are our personal viewpoints. Um, if one would accept that reliability is related to trustworthiness and uh, a very low chance of making errors, then I think that what I am saying here, uh, reliability in science and reliability in legal setting, really, to me, doesn't look very different. Okay, those are all the questions I see unless there's other ones. No, those are the ones that we have received. There's a there's a comment from Jeff Salyards uh, saying very nice job. Um, oh, two two more just came in. Okay. Uh, so the next, um, what is the most reliable method of determining the number of contributors to a result with greater than three? So there's there's a new probabilistic systems that are coming out that that assist with that. There's one called knock it number of contributors with um, that uh, IT uh, at the end that uh, was developed by Catherine Gergacek and colleagues at Rutgers University and Boston University that uh, allow um, consideration of probabilities because sometimes you may have it because of the number of peaks and the peak heights you have it may be milk like three but a little bit of four and so on but that's part of the challenge is you get more and more contributors in a, in a mixture is that blurring because of the allele overlap a blurring of the, the confidence you have with the number of contributors. So there are probability methods that are being developed. There's a new one just published, the PACE uh, system that was just published uh, by a group up at Syracuse University that looks at this probabilistically. I just want to add to that. From the point of view of uh, assessing reliability, uh, the HP and HD uh, that are of interest were POI is in the mixture, POI is not in the mixture. Now, individual LR systems can have some intermediate steps of their own to facilitate LR computation where they need a number of contributors specified or not. The reliability assessment doesn't care about any of that. It's what 
likelihood ratios are being produced on the basis of that the reliability can be assessed and the last question I have that I can see here is you only consider very simple propositions to make the simplest departure what if the crime scene is from a murder scene and the person of interest is a brother so yes it is possible to do calculations with relatives I want to add so the prosecution comes up with their theory which is expressed as HP the defense proposition is that HP is false okay is there any other uh, questions that people have or are we I guess we're I guess we're close to the end of our hour here so unless anybody has a burning question um, anything came in no all right. Well, uh, thank you, Harry and, and John. This was really interesting. Uh, maybe we can get an update uh, as, as the